welcome everybody. Why don't we start uh, after the Manor of Friends with a moment of shared silence. Thank you so much. It's great to be here with everyone tonight. For those of you who I don't know, my name is Anna Wyeth. I'm the Director of Alumni Engagement here at Sidwell Friends. Thank you for being here for this Conversation with Friends event. Um, before we get started, just a couple of quick housekeeping notes. Um, I encourage you, if you feel comfortable, to keep your video on. It really helps us feel that full participation of everybody who's here tonight. I also would encourage you to change your Zoom name to include your full name and your connection to Sidwell Friends. So if you're an alum, that's your class year. For those uh, who are connected to the school otherwise, you might be a current parent, a parent of an alum, a grandparent, perhaps a current or former faculty member. Um, if you've never changed your name on Zoom before, you can do so by going to the participant list and hovering over your own name. And under that more button, you'll see an option to rename and that's where you can add in that information can just think of it like your virtual name tag um, that helps everybody else see who's here, just like you would if we were all together in person. We'll ask that everyone keeps themselves on mute just to minimize disruptions. And we'll save asking questions for the dedicated Q&A portion of the end of the event a bit later. So throughout tonight, if you have questions for our speakers, please feel free to send them to, via the chat to me, Anna Wyeth, and I will happily offer them up during the Q&A. Now, finally, the real reason we are all here tonight, I'm so excited to introduce our featured speakers. Liza Donnelly is a member of the class of 1973 and a longtime cartoonist and writer for the New Yorker magazine, as well as a contributor to the New York Times, Washington Post, Medium, CNN, and CBS News. She's the author of 18 books. Her book, Women on Men, was a finalist for the Thurber Prize for American Humor. And her most recent book, The Reason We Are Here Tonight, is Very Funny Ladies, The New Yorker's Women Cartoonists. It's a history of women cartoonists at the magazine since 1925. Her TED Talk, Drawing on Humor for Change, has had 1.4 million views online and has been translated into 40 languages. She was also named a cultural envoy for the US State Department. Liza is a Barnard Athena Distinguished Leadership Fellow and received an honorary PhD from the University of Connecticut. She's the innovator of digital visual journalism and she attends news and cultural events and draws and shares them in real time. She currently lives in New York and loves to live draw on the subway and elsewhere throughout the city. Leading our conversation with Liza tonight is another alum class of 1987, John Dickerson. John is the CBS News political, excuse me, CBS News chief political analyst senior national correspondent and CBS Sunday morning contributor. He recently published his third book, second New York Times bestseller, The Hardest Job in the World, The American Presidency. He was previously co-anchor of CBS This Morning, as well as the anchor of Face the Nation and CBS News chief Washington correspondent. He is a contributing writer to The Atlantic, as well as the host and co-host on the podcast, Political Gab Fest from Slate and the Whistle Stop podcast. John started his career with Time Magazine covering economics, Congress, and the presidency. For a decade, he was also Slate Magazine's chief political correspondent, and he has covered the last seven presidential campaigns. His mother, Nancy Dickerson, was CBS News' first female correspondent. John graduated from the University of Virginia with a bachelor's degree in English and a specialty in American studies. He is the recipient of the Ford Prize for Distinguished Reporting on the Presidency and the David Broder Award for Political Reporting. And he now resides also in New York City with his family. So John, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Great, thank you so much, Anna. It's great to be with all of you uh, in this virtual space. Um, and Liza, it's really great to be with you. Um, Although we're in the same city, you're on the other side of the country. Um, yeah, I'm in a hotel room. Sorry about that. It's really boring <laughs> yes. behind me. It's like not, I don't, not my studio. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, unless you decided that it was conducive to drawing cartoons that you had a studio that looked um, like a hotel, <laughs> which might be your thing. We'll get into your process later. Um, but we, before we start, we have to start every, um, since every other 
presentation starts with a New Yorker cartoon, we should start a discussion about New Yorker cartoons with a New Yorker cartoon. So will you serve us up one of, uh, well, one of the entries from your book? Okay. And then we'll talk about it. Okay. So uh, will you, how does, how does one narrate a cartoon? What does one do? What is the proper form? Do you <laughs> let people enjoy it or do you read it for them? Or how question. does it work? A friend of mine, uh, Danny Shanahan, used to show in his PowerPoints, if he was doing an event, he would show the image first. People could, could sort of take that in and then he then the caption would pop up. I didn't do that, but um, it's helpful because I think there's so much to take in right away. Yeah. Um, but uh, this is an old fashioned format that the New Yorker dropped soon after this one ran. I mean, they kept, it was called the he said, she said kind of cartoon. And the uncle is saying, poor girl, so few get their wages. And the flapper is saying, so few get their sin, darn it. <laughs> and um, it, yeah, <laughs> that, that, that was the old kind of captions uh, that was more like an illustrated joke. Um, and uh, the New Yorker sought to get rid of that and do what we now know as a New Yorker cartoon, which is so much different. This, the reason why I chose this one is that it's the first cartoon by the first woman in the first issue. So um, she was the only woman in that issue in 1925. Ethel Plummer and, was her name. And so I was, should I be surprised? And 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 then I'll tell you whether I was surprised or not that um, Ethel Plummer was in the very first issue of the New Yorker. Was that a, because in most other things you have men ruining everything for a period of time and then the, and then women are allowed to, to join in. But to be in the first issue, was that, um, just natural, or was that uh, an innovation and, and part of the cutting edge nature of the New Yorker? I think it was part of the cutting edge nature of the New Yorker, because I think uh, um, comics and cartoons are really a man's world. You know, it was the, it was the, the era of illustration and, and cartoons and comics. Um, in that 19 in the in the early part of the last century, and um, was mostly men. And I think the New Yorker uh, was founded by Harold Ross and Jane Grant. Uh, they happened to be married. And Jane Grant actually was a city reporter for the New York Times, which was unusual. Uh, mm -hmm. And she was an active activist feminist. Um, and they founded the New Yorker together. She didn't stay with the magazine running it. But um, so I think there was a, you know, a feminist bent to it in the beginning. And also it was the 20s, uh, right after the suffrage was won. And, and women were, some women were, were running to the urban areas to to join life and um, the New Yorker, one of the best talent in the in the city, and I think many of those really good artists were women. So they just they just got women. Let's stop so, sharing the screen. Hold on. Oh wait, hold on before you before you take it away. Oh, sure. Um, I just want to linger on the image for just a moment. Uh -huh. Um, so do we think Uncle is really the flapper's uncle? I assume he is. Okay. Because the flappers were really young, many of them, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so this is the period of New York where, um, you know, uh, New York is the hottest town in the country. Hollywood hasn't happened yet. And um, there is this, I guess what interests me about this is it's, a, it's pretty racy. Um, now, of course, the, the bootlegging age in New York was a pretty racy place, but what um, give us give us an, a sense of when the magazine's starting? Um, you know, cartoons are always kind of feels like they're always pushing right at the edge and playing with um, uh, different roles that are in society, and 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 obviously mm -hmm. that's at play here. Um, mm -hmm. So that was right off the bat. The New Yorker was was kind of um, well. It, there's a wink, or this is just basically explicit. <laughs> Uh, it, 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 well, uh, maybe people may not know that the New Yorker was founded as a humor magazine and uh, they wanted to make a magazine that was appeal, that appealed to the urban elite. So um, there was nothing like it, humor magazine, which was very down home. A lot of the humor was Will Rogers type humor and that Harold Ross saw, uh, saw a need and Jane Grant saw a need for uh, in the moment 
cartoons and humor. Yeah. You know, that, that captured the zeitgeist of the times and they and they did it. Right. Yeah. And some um, of it was racy. Some of it was racy. Yeah. I'm um some of it was sexist and some of it was racist. Too. Right. Well, that's the thing, is is yeah. you have um, I mean, it, 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 in essentially in, in 1925, you have a you know, a young woman here saying that that um, she wishes she could get a little more sin, which is a, you know, that I mean, in certain drawing rooms, that would that would stop the conversation. Um, <laughs> even though, right, even though in New York at the time you had, I think the number of brothels in New York was um, in the thousands um, okay. during that period. So it was, you know, there was this whole sort of inside outside part of the New Yorker and and these cartoons seem to kind of uh, right. grab that. Um, okay. You remember, you probably heard this. Ross said that the New Yorker was not for the little old lady in Dubuque. Yes, um, right. Humor does that sometimes. It it separates people. It tries to make the clubs separate. You know, we're in this club. You're not because you don't get the joke. Um, right. Mm -hmm. Now, speaking of being in a club and not being in a club, what what drew you to write about these women and this club um, originally? Okay, John, I'm going to try to stop sharing, okay. screen, but yeah. I can't get my cursor to, to light on the right thing. Ah, there. Hold on. Sorry. Sorry, guys. There we go. Oh, there we go. Really? I didn't. Okay, there we go. Um, yeah, I mean, is it gone? Yes. It's gone from my, All right. my view. Um, well, you know, I... Uh, I as many of my colleagues, one of my classmates know, I really was drawing early on and I wanted to be a cartoonist. And um, I didn't think about gender at the time. I didn't want to be a woman cartoonist. I still don't think I'm a female cartoonist or a woman cartoonist. I'm just a cartoonist. But uh, uh, so I just I just plugged ahead and, and became a cartoonist. And um, it wasn't until, and I was aware that there weren't many women doing this, but I, I think I saw it as a challenge actually. And uh, um, in 1999, I was invited to be on a panel of cartoonists from the, uh, that was at the American Association of Editorial Cartoonists Convention. I was not a member, but uh, people knew who I was. And so I, I said, yes, I'll do that. And um, it's a panel of women cartoonists. There are about five of us, I think. There were not many women doing editorial cartoons then or now, mm -hmm. um, but they needed somebody else, so they got me. And I'd done political cartoons, but just for The New Yorker. And uh, I, so in preparation for that panel, I started thinking more seriously about why there aren't more, more women. And, um, and I got to the convention and I sat in the room, it was a conference room, and I looked out in, in the audience at all the people that had come to see us speak. And it was a sea full, a room full of men. And it just was like a visual uh, hit over the head that like <laughs> knocked me off of my seat. And uh, I thought, what, what, you know, wow, okay. So I have to figure this out. So I, I went and, and started researching in the New Yorker and I found Ethel Plummer and I started looking more. I knew there were a couple of women like Helen Hokanson, but I, I didn't know the extent of it. So it was great. That's what, that was, that's what happened. <laughs> and, and, and as you, um, so was Ethel Plummer, um, did she have equity and was she, give me a sense of the, the progression of, of um, women cartoonists and was Ethel Plummer, was she, um, equal to the, to the male cartoonist? Was she an oddity? How did it, if, if, if the New Yorker was cutting edge at the beginning, how did the ball bounce from there? I think, uh, I think at the New Yorker, I think they were pretty equal for a while. And I think she was already a well-established artist in New York um, doing other things. I forget when she, I forget how old she was when she sold to the New Yorker, but um, I think in those early years, like the twenties and thirties, they 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 pretty much uh, were equal. And then Helen Hokanson found out that Peter Arno was getting paid more than she was, and she raised hell, and and that was changed. So. <laughs> could um, could they make jokes that were different? I'm trying to think if that flapper joke would have been written by. Do you think that flapper joke would have could have been written by a man at that time? Question. Wow. A, would a man have, because I guess there are two questions, sorry to stomp on my own question, but A, would a man have seen it that way? And then would they have been held back from writing that? I, mean, I guess it's, which is, I'm going to ask you this question throughout the generations, but but I'm just curious about that first one. I think maybe a man could have written that because it's making fun of the flappers. Uh, and it's not, it's not a, 
sexist joke necessarily. Uh, do, you, do, you, do you, I don't know. I think, I think that could have been, mm-hmm. could have been written by a man, um, but we'll never know. <laughs> and, and as the, as it progresses, what do they, um, is the humor, does it get um, kind of put into categories or, or could you look through a series of New Yorker cartoons and from the early period and basically not know whether it was a, a male or a female cartoonist? That's a great, great question. Um, they were not in categories quite yet, <clears throat> but, uh, um, and I don't know if they ever were. I'm trying to think about that. We, we don't, we, it, it's hard to, hmm. I never, I studied the women, but I never studied the cartoon right. as a whole, like, because I think uh, you can see in the early days, there were, there were women doing more cartoons about women because what, it's what they know, but they were also doing cartoons about men. Um, and, but the men couldn't really, probably shouldn't have, and they probably, and they didn't make fun of women in a certain way. Women can, yeah. men can't. So and Catherine White, Catherine Angel White was um, an early editor at the magazine. And she, uh, one of her duties, one of her small duties, she had a lot of duties was to make sure that the cartoons didn't tread on women too heavily. So, hmm. yeah. And was that something Ross wanted or was that a... No, I don't know. Yeah. No. Tell me about the early cartoonists. Did Were they of a certain type? Were they, uh, what were their characteristics from that from that early group i think a lot of them were uh classically trained you know and of course you didn't go to school to study cartoons necessarily Mm -hmm. i don't think there was any any of that although cartoons are really popular but uh you know john i don't know they uh, they must have been funny people who knows yeah in, did there? I, I should have put this context in there earlier because when you think of a New Yorker cartoon, I mean, people just they they say, "Oh, well, that's a New Yorker cartoon." But they, they didn't. I guess my question is, did they grow out of the New Yorker, or was the were there cartoons that were essentially like this, and then just they became associated with the New Yorker? Because I think of 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 the political cartoons and the other kind of cartoons that are actually not that clever. They're just sort of illustrations and they're called cartoons but there's yeah. just nothing like this yeah the 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 editors and the writers at the magazine worked with the artists in those early days to i don't know the extent of it but it was i think it was fairly common like in the 20s to create what we now know as the new yorker cartoon which is a an image with a caption that sort of works so seamlessly and they sort of dance together that you don't you're not really noticing the joke. And it's often a slice of life. I was going to show you one. Yeah. Um, uh, <clears throat> let's see. This is by, where is it? <clears throat> Helen Hokanson. Uh, <clears throat> I love driving. It gives you such a sense of power. Uh, that's a, slice of life and it says a lot in the one drawing and it's visually very funny um it says something about the women it says something about the culture it says something about you know misogyny you know so it's got a lot going on in that one drawing she was a very popular cartoonist in the 20s 30s she died early in a plane crash in 1949 mm-hmm. um, but she was really popular and um all right, show us another one because there's some from this age that it, so what I love is the New Yorkers feel modern to all of us when we read them, but of course this feels quite modern. I mean, obviously, but the, but the idea and the topic feels quite modern, um, mm-hmm. even though driving cars is not, you know. Yeah, it's, hold on. It's now an equal opportunity event. I'm trying to navigate this and, and look at this PowerPoint and show it to you at the same time. Okay, so here's another Helen Hokanson. Um, <laughs> that uh, everybody seems to love and it's great. She did a lot of these matrons yeah. um, and the woman's, the, you know, this is the club ladies. And she's saying, I shall now quote the passages which I consider obscene. Um, <laughs> and this is her, this is one of her signature 
scenarios. She did a lot of these different different things happening in this little club room, and her ladies were very um, were were loved by the public. Uh, this is a little bit later. I don't know the exact date, but it's probably in the early '30s. And um, she started out drawing uh, flappers like the other women did, but um, soon began drawing, making fun of, teasing Lee these. Uh, uh, I don't know how to put it, uh, heavy set matrons, mm -hmm. and the public loved it. And then she was on the, they were on the cover, and and her work uh, moved away from from the feminist, any slight feminist tone she had in the in the early part of the um, uh, the magazine, um, which I think is interesting. She became very popular. I was talking with my husband, who's also a New Yorker cartoonist, about this. Michael Maslin, we're talking about this. We talk cartoons all the time. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, Helen Hokanson uh, started out in, the, in 25, as did this other cartoonist whom I love, Barbara Sherman. And Barbara Sherman did a lot of flapper cartoons and a lot of, and I can show you some, a lot of cartoons that were very forward uh, and, and modern in, in tone and, and feminist. And um, Barbara was very popular, very prolific in those early years, 20, in the 20s and 30s. But Helen Hookerson got even more famous because she was making fun of these, these ladies, these matrons. And then I think that was easier for the public to stomach, was making fun of the matrons and not, not making, and, and Barbara Sherman's work lost favor after a while because it was, it was more feminist. That's my theory. Oh, interesting. Yeah. A little too, um, so we all like to snicker, but, but the, but the f feminism was touching on real power exchanges. Yeah, yeah I'm trying to, yeah. I'm sorry, John. I can't. I can't seem to get the cursor to. It's all right. It lets people linger on. Oh, here we go. This is great. Oh, this one, <laughs> I'll just go through the slideshow and we can talk. Yeah, sure. That's good. I'm yeah, that's where that works for me. Back and forth. Yeah, okay. that works for me. This is, uh, this is Alice Harvey. Uh, oh, she's very attractive. I don't like her at all. And this is, you know, she's making fun of women here. Yeah. Awesome. Um, Alice right. Harvey. Mm -hmm. She was from Alice was from from Chicago and uh, uh, and go ahead. That's straight up envy, and that's I mean you could basically if it hadn't been done already you could read that this week and you would yeah you'd be it would be perfectly reasonable. But you yeah and, and you see that it's a New Yorker cartoon. It's not a joke per se. It's a piece of life. Um, right. And women, women's lives. Um, another one by Alice, same, same sort of thing. And what was that woman's name? You know, the one we liked her husband so much. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and I so, love the way she draws it. You know, look at the way. You know, it's not just two women sitting and talking to each other. They're doing something. Right, mm -hmm. right, right. So, you mentioned that you deconstruct or you talk cartoons with your husband all the time, which is. Um, uh, I mean, I think all, I, I wonder if you find this with your other creative friends that basically people who writers, um, artists, well, okay, let me, sorry, let me, <laughs> let me phrase this the way a person who asks questions for a living would phrase it. Why do you talk about cartoons all the time? Because we love cartoons. We love, I should phrase that differently. We love New Yorker cartoons. Yeah, we're historians of of the of the art form, and so we analyze it like 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 mathematicians, <laughs> right? We analyze, a, 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 and I and I and I know that uh, was it. Eb no, who who said it? Uh, you can't dissect humor. Um, it's like dissecting a frog. Right. I, I don't have you know you know the phrase. Yes, yes, yes. Kill, I think it was might have been Twain, but. Uh, Anyway, no, I did E.B. White. Yorker. Oh, it was a New Yorker person? Okay, well then let's just say it was E.B. White because you got a really good chance it's going to be White. <laughs> right. um, the, but the, on the other hand, I mean, sure, you can't dissect humor. And yet on the other hand, you have a craft mm. and you have precise ideas mm -hmm. because those are what inform your work. Um, so don't you have to because you, you, it is work. It is not, I mean, I'm sure I want to talk to you about where inspiration comes and does it hit you on the, you know, on the subway or, um, but, but it's also you, you develop a theory of why cartoons work and why they don't. 
um, which you've already illuminated some of these with us. So show us another cartoon and give us your, your narration of it to give us a sense of how you look at cartoons. Well, I should also say that uh, we analyze cartoons. We don't really analyze our own work. I certainly don't, we don't do it together. Like we don't share our work yeah. that much, but, and also if you analyze your own process or you think about what's funny, what it, it, it doesn't always work. I'm sure that's like writing too, right? That you, you, you got to think about it on some level, but you can't think about it too much because you'll, you'll ruin it. <laughs> but as a historian, I'm like, <laughs> <other people>. well, <laughs> true. Although, so let me ask you if, the, if, the, if you go through this though, okay, hold on. Uh, yes, Jane was stunning, but she's married now. This is a uh, making fun of women, but it's also making fun of the culture. I sure. Think. Yeah. Um, so, so as you say, here they are. They're just hanging out, right? So this is the idea is that this is a slice of life again, as you say. And and is it the slice of life feeling? In other words, this is a this is just like daily life. There's nothing special about this, but what they're saying is a little sparkly. It's a little uh, arresting. Mm -hmm. And the idea that it's arresting in this quotidian setting is kind of where some of the magic happens. Yeah, that's great. Great. Well put. And this is, uh, this is Barbara Sherman, my favorite woman from that time. And you can see her feminism peeking out there. Um, because it's 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 women gossiping, but they're also commenting on how marriage ruins everything. Right. I believe, but uh, um, in that time period, it was probably very difficult for women to be themselves and be married. So right. Um, so back on a question on your process, you were saying you know if you if you press it if you're too intentional or you're too self-critical then it ruins it but tell me then about your process because i because they obviously do, or do they come just fully formed from your head i mean there must be some process where you think ah, it's not quite right oh yeah no yeah um there's a couple times in my life that's come right out without any changing not very many it's a, it's a lot yeah. like you said it's work you gotta you have a you have a uh, a seed that appears, and if you do this long enough, it's it's like writing. I assume. I mean, I write to it, but I'm appealing to your um, your process. You you have a little essence of what you think might work, and you sort of nurture it and play with it a little bit, and then and then put it aside, and then come back to it, and then you write the caption, and then you think, oh, that imagery doesn't really work with that caption. Maybe I should do it this way uh oh that word should be in the front and then that one no I don't, that one's not a funny word so i'll find another one so it's all like that <laughs> yeah and is there is does the rhythm of the caption change or how do you imagine people taking in the cartoon and how does that how does that affect the way both you you draw it and you write the caption so i mean in other words if i'm seeing the image first how does that inform how I read the caption? How, what, what do you think? Do people read the caption first or see the image first? Or do you have a conception of that and does it matter? I don't really, I don't really know. I think they probably do what I'm doing right now. It's like, look at them both like yeah. back and forth or look at the image first and then go down to the caption. It's like, like looking at a painting in a, in a museum, you go look at the image and you, you wanna see who did it. <laughs> what it's called to give you some insight into the painting. Right. But, um, I don't, I don't, I don't think a lot of us think about our audience that much. You, you have to, but I don't consciously think about my audience. Yeah. I mean, I've been doing a long time for the New Yorker, so I kind of know my audience. All right, no, right. no, I shouldn't say that's kind of arrogant to say that, but I sort of have a sense of what might work and what wouldn't work. Like the political stuff I do, I know sometimes they won't buy it. So, yeah. And do you always have a notebook with you? I do for the capturing of of for i don't know to see as you called it yes yeah. but or i use notes on my phone like the note program on my phone too yeah but uh yeah how um how new york centered 
are New Yorker cartoons and how, I mean, that's one category, right? The life in New York. Um, was that more the case in the, in the, in, in its history and how much of it is, um, is New York centered now in, in, in the cartoons in New York, in New I Yorker? It was, I think it was really New York centered back in the early days and then it gradually got less so. Um, and now I don't think it's, people might disagree with me. What do you think, John? I think it's not so New York centered anymore. At least on the magazine part, the, the online. No, I think both. I think they're both. Yeah. Different. No, I think you're right. I mean, I think the early New Yorker was synonymous with New York City, which was, again, Broadway was, it's what we think of Hollywood being now. And, and, and so it was access to a whole other world that was synonymous with New York. So you could kind of do a New York joke and you were in the club. Mm -hmm. Now the jokes are every, you know, it's, yeah. the club is not geographical so much. Um, I got another one. Yeah. Oh, this is my, this is my favorite. So what's oh, really? happening here? It's my favorite too. Yeah. Uh, this is Barbara Sherman, and it's a sequential for those of you who don't quite get it yet. Sequential. So it starts in the upper left hand side. You go across the page like you're reading a book, and the man. You can see what he's doing. He's just talking. She's not saying a word. Just looking the same in every single uh, image, and then it, at the end he says, "You're a very intelligent little woman, my dear." Um. Why do you like it? <laughs> well, because um, there was a, there was a, um, I'm trying to remember the rule in Washington, uh, which I was, I was about to say in Washington where I grew up, which was a, be a little redundant on this call, on this uh, <laughs> Zoom. But anyway, in, in that, that women in the 50s and 60s, um, uh, basically you would just say, what do you do? at a dinner party and then dessert would come because the man you were sitting next to would just <laughs> monologue for the entire rest of the dinner, just going on and on and on and on. And you only had to come with one question, what do you do? And implicit in that was of course, that the woman didn't do anything um, worth having a conversation about. And also that all you had to do was just ask, what do you do? And then the man would gas on for, the length of the dinner. And so I feel like that's what's what's happening here. Um, and then also at the end, he puts his hand on her knee. Oh, right. I, I left that out by mistake. Yeah. yeah. Um, and also she, I like the way it's drawn. She's looking at him throughout the first eight sequences and then nine, she's straight ahead in a right. sort of <laughs> shock. Yeah, right. Um, Although she shouldn't be shocked, really, right? If she's been around. True enough. Three yes. Years to be, this is, she's learning that this is the way the world is. Yes, right. Uh, and was. And also, it sort of got perfectly the kind of the, the, the Monopoly man, you know, that wrote the round. Oh, it's just yeah. like, there's just so. Now, what year would this have been, Liza? I should have come prepared with numbers. Um, I think oh, hold it's on, I can find it in the book. I've like got the book right here. Um, well, it'll take you a while to find the date. I think it's in the back. Um, it's probably in the 20s. The, uh, oh, it's so great. Um, another one? Yeah. This is another Sherman. See, this is why I love her. These two women are talking and, and uh, she said, well, of course I do say I'll never marry. Though somehow I've always wanted to be a widow. <laughs> <laughs> and so artistically, what's going on here? Well, artistically, I find this interesting because Barbara Sherman, I think this was, I know this, this was earlier in her career than the previous one. Um, she experimented with style in her early years. She's from, she was from San Francisco and moved east also classically trained and did and did paintings and covers early. Her first one was a cover for the New Yorker. I think it was, I, I don't remember the date, um, but it almost looks like a print. Yeah. So she was trying different styles out and then her, her style really radically changes in the fifties. So I, I don't have any of those, but uh, she, I don't know her voice, her, I, I, I I'm, I'm passionate about her too, because her voice was so strong. Her, feminist 
cartoonist voice was very strong in those early years and it just sort of lost favor, I, I, I gather. And uh, she struggled. So she was very popular in the magazine in the early years, but. And why did that voice lose favor at the New Yorker? The feminist voice uh, more, more broadly. I mean, not just yeah. specific to her. Uh, I don't know. I don't know the, the, the full details of it. I've read a lot of the letters, but I don't have any proof that they stopped buying her for particular reasons. But um, my feeling is that after the depression and then heading into World War II, the country got more um, conservative and more domesticated and uh, more following the rules more closely for, for gender, gender roles. And so women, the women were, were going back to, to being housewives. She was never a housewife. She married briefly a few times, but she was traveling all over the world. And I don't know, I just think her, her the feminist cartoons that she did were just not not popular, the culture right. was changing. And um, there were more cartoons about raising children. And then of course in the, not of course, but then in the, in the 60s, there were no women cartoonists at the magazine. Now, what's new, up with that? Ed, there was a new editor too. He came in in 1939, I believe, uh, James Garrity. Uh, and I think he had his tastes and um, it may not have included women. I don't have any proof of that, but. <laughs> <laughs> but what? What, but go back to the 60s. Yeah. What was up with that? Well, like I said, I think James Garrity came on board and then um, the cartoon became very, very popular, very famous. The New Yorker cartoon began to be a thing and there were a lot of gag writers. Yeah. Gag writers became a thing before previously. It all, you know, artists pretty much did their own cartoons, although Helen Hokinson had her own writer. Um, and it became sort of a a thing, you know, like a, a not, I'm not gonna say wrote because there were some great cartoons in the fifties, but um, they became formatted, more formatted than before. Yeah. With the exception of Saul Steinberg who showed up, I forget the year he showed up, but um, they were very formatted and, and many of them were misogynistic, you know, chasing secretaries around the desk and stuff like that. So. Right. Um, women were not inclined. They were not inclined. And the culture, you, you know this, the culture was women aren't funny. Being funny is a man's job with some exceptions like Lucille Ball and, and Phyllis Diller but, um, and, and the Carol Burnett. But women were not supposed to be funny. Right. And Christopher Hitchens wrote that essay. Yeah. In the oh, 2000. When was that? Oh, I, I, th I, I thought we were already into the 2000s, but maybe I'm uh, I'll look it up here. <laughs> um, and when, so when did that change? Well, in uh, this after um, in 1973, my husband's going to tell me I got my dates wrong, but it's either 70, I think it's 73. Uh, the New Yorker hired a new cartoon editor, uh, Lee Lorenz. And um, this was also right after the second wave of feminism. So those two things combined. I think more women started coming in. Lee, um, I interviewed him for my my book, uh, the first edition of this book, and I said, "Were you looking for women cartoonists?" And he said, "No, I was just looking for new ways to express humor." So if you if you open that standard or or expand what what can be considered good, then you mm -hmm. get more diversity. And I think that the cartoon had been narrowed to a certain shtick, right? And, and Lee sought to open it up and he did. And he brought in Roz Chast. He brought in a, an Israeli cartoonist, Nurek Carlin, who was living in New York, um, but she um, became, she came in 1974 and Roz came in in 1977, I think, and, uh, or eight, 78. And another Roz, Roz and Ango came in around that time. And I came in in 79. And our, all of our work was uh, slightly different than what was normally seen in the magazine, so. I want to talk. I want to talk about your your work before we turn it over to questions. So a couple of rapid fire. Should we go couple, through some of these? Yeah, let's go through these, and then we'll just. So you just let's go through them, and then and then I will ask about your work. So go uh -huh. ahead. This is an, this is a later Barbara Sherman. Um, then I wrote him an awfully nasty letter, but you know, cute. <laughs> well, you can see her style is changing again, and this is. Um, 
uh, just talking about women having to follow certain rules. Yeah. Um, early Helen Hokanson, when women wore amazing hats. Uh, how about a wisp of a veil, Alphonsine, just for witchery? <laughs> um, this is a woman we haven't talked about yet. Yeah. Uh, I've finally decided to go to college. All the all all you lose is four years. This is uh, this is uh, Mary Petty, who came a little bit later, self-taught. And if you if you if you're a fan of of old New Yorkers. You might know her work as the she did a lot of Victorian scenes mm -hmm. and uh, had that that maid with the the frilly maid outfit and uh, on the she had a lot of covers. Mary Petty was great. Also married mm -hmm. to a, a New Yorker cartoonist, Alan Dunn, um, an early uh, showman. <laughs> I thought of something clever for you to say at dinner tonight, Arbuckle. <laughs> Arbuckle. <laughs> ah, that, I love that one too. No. Um, we saw that one. This is great, John. Uh, she's saying, I don't think he's abnormal. I think he's, I'm sorry. I don't think he's abnormal. He's just versatile. <laughs> and this is Barbara Sherman. And I really think, I don't know. I think this is referring to a man who might be gay, right? Or gender fluid. Yeah. When he's yeah. I, that's, I, uh, yeah, that was one of the possible interpretations. Yes. Um, what was it? What was another one? Well, I, I, <laughs> I can't stick with yours. Okay. Um, good heavens, my dear! Here comes one of those healthy dancers. <laughs> <laughs> so this we all, is know, we all know one of those people, right? Right, right. Although the dancing, can you know, since we all don't go to dances so much, that are there other veins of humor that have died out? Because you can imagine this being. Kind of you could mine this uh, the predatory rotund man you know penguining across the parquet floor could 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 you know you could imagine a lot of of captions that would go with that but we don't do that anymore no yeah yeah dancing i can't think of another i mean i'm sure there are plenty of other scenarios that we would never draw anymore um, right the hat thing. I mean, there were a lot of hat cartoons in the New Yorker. All yeah. Done women, all done by women. Um, and that makes no sense now. Right. Although different kinds of hats, I suppose. Um, it is then obvious, ladies, that though we may not all be beautiful, we can all be smart. <laughs> Helen Hokanson. And then this, uh, two more. Uh, this is a Roberta McDonald who did cartoons around the the war time. Uh, and, uh, you asked me earlier before the before the uh, Zoom about women who um, was there a Dorothy Parker like cartoonist in the bunch, and I I don't know, but uh, I think maybe Barbara Sherman held her own uh, with her wit, and also I I talked to Roberta McDonald's daughter at length, and I think she also was was quite the um, party goer and quite the. Uh, held her own with 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 the men as well yeah and this is another one of hers about wax oh i love this one yeah so um i think those are all the ones that i have of, of older cartoons all right well, let's let's get to you before we get to questions uh so this is one of my this yeah. is my first published new yorker cartoon and slice of life uh man walks down the street and he says, maybe I don't pet dogs enough. And then he goes back and pets the dog and moves on. So it, it, it's, uh, it's subtle. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, um, how much, how much when, when you were growing up was the New Yorker slash James Thurber in your life? A lot. Uh, uh, my parents had the New Yorker like any self-respecting uh, upper middle class house. <laughs> right. Um, but anyway, uh, my mother loved uh, Thurber and she gave me a book of cartoons. One day I was home sick from school. I think I was about seven. Uh -huh. Wasn't it Sidwell yet? Uh, and I started tracing the cartoons and it made her smile. Oh. But yeah, so I, Thurber, this, oh, Thurber, wow, Thurber's great. This, feel, this I was feeling very Thurber. Oh yeah? Uh, 
Thank you. You know, when I saw this. So, um, and what was that like getting your first cartoon in the New Yorker? Oh, it was, it was great. I mean, <laughs> I can't, there's not, I don't know. It's just, it, that's, that must have been huge. It was huge for me. And yeah. uh, I couldn't quit my job yet. I worked at a museum, uh, the Natural History Museum in New York. I was working there. Oh. And uh, I just felt like you were being, you were, you were being brought into the fold. Yeah, I had been submitting for a couple of years and that's typical. You know, you submit every week for a couple of years. And, and then uh, one day you go in to pick up your rejected cartoons and from a, whim, from a woman in a vestibule window, it's like a window on the 20th floor and you pick up your envelope. And um, I opened my envelope and it said, uh, no, no, she said to me, uh, Lee Lorenz would like to see you. And I just practically, you know, fainted. Uh, and I went in to see him and, and uh, he said, we want to buy this one. And then later, uh, like two days later, I called him and I said, what kind of style do you want me to draw this in? And he said, well, draw it in your style. And I thought, <laughs> I have a style? So <laughs> it was very exciting. I was 24, I was scared and it was, it was great. Oh my gosh. Dream come true, yeah. <laughs> yeah, all right, let's see, let's see another one. Uh, my first political cartoon, John, <clears throat> 1984. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if people remember, but Fritz Mondale, wonderful. I mean, I never met him. I'm sure you did, but uh, we weren't that we weren't that excited about him. It was like, <laughs> okay, he's going to be fine, right? My yeah, um, yeah, M Minnesota nice. Mm -hmm. um, his campaign headquarters was on Wisconsin Avenue, oh, really? uh, just down from what used to be the Whole Foods, up from the Safeway, um, <laughs> and. Uh, that's very funny. So obviously somebody's reading their fortune and- Yeah, they were being told to, to vote for Fritz. Um, this is a later- <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Some wine with your vest. And I like to show this one because it's like, a begin I, I think this was during Tina Brown's era. Uh -huh. And I was starting to draw women making fun of men. And I, I was at a period of my career where I thought, well, I could, I could make the woman the, the protagonist in all my cartoons if I really want to, because uh, why not? And uh, I started making fun of men. And I think she she bought a bunch of them. And I, I didn't really realize until later that there was there was a, I only met her twice. It was not like I worked with Tina Brown, but uh, I met her twice. And, and the stuff that she bought encouraged me to probably to continue in that vein. And so normally when you get the envelope, would it, would you know you were already uh, in or out or or would you open up the envelope and see if it had whatever the signifier was that you were in or out. I just feel like it's college acceptance all over again, frankly. Oh, it's maybe it's because we're totally. in that season. I mean, it's kind of like we're auditioning every week. Yeah. Still, we don't use envelopes, we use email. Uh, but yeah, I think we got a, I think you'd pick up your envelope, look inside and there would be a pink, a pink, no, no, wait. He would write on the, on the rough drawing and said, okay, which is the phrase we, you, you get an okay. And, um, and then you go home and you uh, celebrate and draw, then draw the finished drawing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so now, but, but and now, um, well, show us another cartoon and then we'll do, uh, cause we're. <laughs> I was a little curious. Uh, uh, this was after, right after 9-11. I, I was, but when 9-11 happened, I was going to give up cartooning and go into teaching or something. I just didn't find anything funny, yeah. but I did this and they bought it. Um, and ran it about a month or so afterwards. And, um, so I just like to show this because this is a you know cartoonist. I have to have their pulse on the culture, and 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 I and I was aware of how scared everybody was, and that's what I tried to express through this little girl. The and also, it would be an interesting test to show that to a variety of people and ask them what year it was, because you could basically that could run to yesterday. I know. Um, I brought it out. You're right. It's. Uh, it's like a former White House correspondent used to say that at any time when a president's walking by, you could say, sir, what about the allegations? Um, and you'd always be in fine shape. Um, so anyway, this has, a, this has a timeless feel to it. Although, and then on the other hand, those of us who, who were, you know, went through 9-11, I mean, that really captures a very, very specific moment too. So that's really great. Thanks. <laughs> uh, like 
because uh, I like to, I, I do these cave people drawings because to show, you know, to shine a light on culture. Uh, it was weird. He got on his knees and put this rock on my finger and asked me to spend the rest of the of my life with just him. So, making fun of uh, our traditions. All right. Um, I like to use the sandbox. I think I'm influenced by Charles Schultz there. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a gender thing. Um, I don't see liking trucks as a boy thing. I see it as a liking trucks thing. And you've done a few in the sandbox, right? I have, yeah. 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 Do you have a sense where you where you're sort of like, ah, this one feels like we're going back to the sandbox for it when you get that seed? Sometimes I think, John, I'm putting the kids in the sandbox first. I think I haven't uh -huh. done a box cartoon in a while. And what, or there's a political thing I want to talk about that seems best done in a in a sandbox. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. good. That's great. Uh, and this I, I think is the last one. I just like to show this because it's uh, it's very now. Yeah. Did you hear that? I think that was the sound of New York coming back. Um, that was done uh, actually not recently. It was it was a daily cartoon. New York right now has a daily cartoon online. Yeah. Uh, this was, I think during that lull when we thought the pandemic was over and then the Omicron came back. So that was, that was nice. anyway, I like doing stoops. Right. It's, it's right. like a well, box in a way. Um, and that feels like, um, and didn't you do, you did, uh, I'd invite you in, but my life, but our life is, a, or my oh, life is yeah. a mess, right? I didn't show that, yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, that's a, that's another one on the stoop, right? Right. Yeah, that one's, Thanks. well, and so, I mean, now that I live here, maybe I'm projecting, but these feel very New York. I mean, yeah. obviously everybody's life is a mess in, in COVID, but the the stoop and the particular way in which New Yorkers' lives are a mess and where this idea of New York coming back, that feels very grounded in yeah. this city. And that may be why this was just a daily cartoon and not in the magazine, because it's it, it doesn't have uh, the same longevity that a cartoon should have in the magazine. Right. So. Um, all right, we should probably, because I'm I've run, I've run, I've blown past our uh, oh. qu question time, but um, Oh gosh. Uh, but I, I, and I have even more questions to ask, but. Um, well, we should so, go on the road, John, and do this. <laughs> yeah, I would love it. I, humor and culture. Because I, I, despite what E.B. White says, um, I mean, I dissect the frog all day long. Um, because when you take it apart, then you know how to, how to put it back together or what to work on. Um, so. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you know, E.B. White was pretty successful. So, um, all right. So, Anna, are there? Am I missing where the questions are? No, no, I've got some. Um, oh, okay. We, I'm happy to offer them up. We've had several questions, Liza, um, about, and you touched on this before, just with the 9/11 cartoon, um, about what will make a cartoon resonate, you know, in the next 50 or 100 years. But, but as well, what are elements that are important for? Um, political cartoons for satire to kind of prod our politics and society in a positive direction. Oh, you know, think that that cartoons or humor could do to maybe decrease divisiveness or or other dark forces at work, so to speak. Wow. Uh, I don't know. Uh, well, the New Yorker political cartoons tend to be less divisive, I think, although they do speak to a certain demographic but they're not like, um, they don't necessarily uh, attack, you know? They're just observing, I think, if I can generalize. And that's, I think, I always see cartoons as dialogue. I don't see it as a way for me to vent my opinion necessarily. I see it as a way to spark conversation. That's not really, I'm, I'm evading the question. It's a pretty heavy duty question. <laughs> fair, that's fair. Um, we did get a question, which is a little bit more of a process question, but um, you haven't yet talked tonight about live drawing, which is something that you've pioneered um, much, but um, I think some people may know that you have live drawn while running the New York Marathon. And we did get a question about how on earth do you draw when you're running? And can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I don't really draw when I'm running. I take walk breaks, but uh, 
Uh, yeah, that's how I met John. John and I met at CBS. I was live drawing. I was the resident cartoonist, and I was live drawing the guests and uh, the 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 control room. And uh, John, I draw, drew John numerous times. Um, but they sent me to um, the DNC, which is a thrill. That's where I first got connected with with uh, the New York with uh, CBS to just draw everything that was going on. I'm such a political junkie that I really enjoyed that. So just trying to like give us people um, a slice of what's happening. Not, not, not comment on it so much, not say, you know, I think this about that. It's more like, this is what I'm seeing. Of course, I make my choices about what I'm looking at and that's my opinion to choose something. But um, yeah, that's the live drawing. And I got to go to the White House, um, women's marches, the Oscars. So it's really, really fun and interesting for me. Yeah, John and I you, met in the green room and we we were talked about iPads, John and I did. I know. We <laughs> so very I, I, well, because we were because I am a big fan of the iPad for some of the research I do is works on old newspapers. And so the iPad is crucial. And so when I saw Liza using the iPad, because I guess I didn't know really how you did what you did. So I was uh, we and we and we used the same program. So that was yeah, right. that was thrilling. Um, when you went to the White House, did, was it for the, when CTM was at the White House that day? Was yeah, that that? Uh, Major Garrett was there. Uh, we were supposed to, I was supposed to draw a uh, Sean Spicer press conference. Yeah. But uh, Spicer, or they decided not to have the press conference that day. So I just stayed around as long as I could to just draw stuff and watch. And one of the cameramen said to me, um, you know, there's going to be a press conference in the White House. Uh, at, at one o'clock, I said, oh, I don't know if I have access to that. I no. He said, stick with me. So I stuck with him and I got into the White House. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Amazing. Um, we had a couple questions about what inspires you in New York. I know I mentioned earlier, you love drawing on the subway, but what are the, are there particular um, places or things that you get inspired by um, when you are sort of observing the world? Just everyday life, I think I really like best. I mean, being in the White House was fun. I got to draw, um, draw just the everyday people there, the cameramen and the, the guards and stuff like that. Uh, but uh, that's what I like to do best is is also draw the the people that are un, unsung, perhaps you know, people that are taking out the trash, or painting the Oscar, you know, touching up the Oscar statue, stuff like that. Are there um, any particular uh, anecdotes or experiences from your time at Sidwell Friends that you can draw a through line to, to link to your creativity or your career, um, things you can look back on from that time in your, in your life? If I can selfishly ask a Sidwell Friends question. Um, I just, I, you know, the, everybody uh, was so, uh, I can't think of the words, easy going with me, like letting me do what I wanted to do. I mean, I was not a great student, but everybody knew that I drew and sort of tolerated it and encouraged me. So that was great. And I did drawings for the yearbook, I think. But um, I didn't spend much time in the art department. I did some, but it was, it was a very, very uh, accepting environment to, to be who I wanted to be. And um, Always, always grateful to Sidwell for that. John, do you have any other lingering questions that you wanted to get to? I know there were a few from our earlier conversations. Um, well, we got to the Sidwell one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't have I guess... funny stories. I wish I had some funny stories, but I don't. I'm sure my classmates do, but I don't. <laughs> I guess one question, Liza, is whether when you were working on the book, it changed the way you thought about your own cartoons or you felt it when you started to do work kind of that was going on at the same time you were working on this book? I don't know. I, I never thought about that, but I know that the, the book coincided with the internet taking off and uh, the publication. And so I, I began doing more, many more feminist cartoons that the New Yorker didn't buy, 
but that I could put online. And so yeah. I began to be much more feminist in my work than ever before. And like writing, drawing about women around the world. And um, I think my whole advocacy for women or activism for women sort of began to explode at that point. And I think it was because the women and also um, talking about the women, I love talking about them. So that opened me up. Everybody knows in my class how shy I was. I was like this really shy kid. And when I did this book, um, I just wanted to go talk to everybody about it. And I did uh, public speaking was no problem anymore because I just wanted to talk about the women. So that's great. Yeah. Do you ever, um, I have a friend who is a, a comedian and is well enough known. And I was saying, you know, as a political correspondent, people have a lot of ideas about politics. Um, <laughs> and he said, yeah, well, people have a lot of ideas about jokes. In other words, you know, they would come with, do people ever come to you and say, I got a great idea for a cartoon to see? They do. <laughs> Do you get and people how do you, that to you, John? Do the people say, I have this great idea for a story about? Well, yeah, people have people have a few feelings about politics and they're not shy about expressing them. Um, so yes, that happens, that happens quite a lot. But um, and 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 so uh, and so do you just nod your head and and hope that the bus comes or um... yeah, that's about that sums it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you, the reason I guess, I mean the that's amusing, but also, is it a quiet process when you're working on a cartoon? In other words, do you have to be in your studio and it's quiet and people aren't bugging, bugging you or is it, can you do it at a coffee shop and? I personally don't, I know people do. This, my colleague sale, Barbara, uh, Barbara Smaller, a contemporary woman, works in a coffee shop. Not a Starbucks, mind you, a coffee mm -hmm. shop. Um, there's a difference in her mind. There is. Uh, my husband has music loudly playing when he works. I don't. I have silence. So maybe that's the Quaker in me. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and you? Do you work, John? You must be silent when you, when you write. Um... If it's in the morning, I can tolerate a little noise because I'm more focused. But then as the day goes on, uh, it gets awful. I have gone run through so many different kinds of noise canceling headphones. And also when you're on the road, it's so yeah, no, I'm I'm very uh I need quiet and I need um in the we just moved into the, a new apartment and it's great. I'm in a room that's probably 10 by seven. It's a very small room but it's all mine, it's on the top floor. You, you can't hear anything. Um, uh, so it's great, yeah, so I'm, I'm like you. Do you, have a, um, do you have a favorite cartoonist? Like, did you grow up with a, a strip that you really liked? Did you ever meet, well, her, the, did you meet her block? I met him once. Herbert no, um, I have one of his books though, because my mother was signed, because my mom knew him. Um, Gary Larson was probably, uh, um, you the far side, um, and so that would, but but um, and that would that would have been my and um, uh, oh, what was the cartoon with Opus Bloom uh, Bloomsbury? Yeah, is that right? I don't, I didn't read it, but yeah, I think that's yeah. Right. Um, so those would have been the cartoons in the Washington Post. I didn't discover, I didn't discover the New Yorker until I found a. Um, I mean, I knew about The New Yorker, but I didn't become, you know, until I found a, a book of S.J. Perlman's letters at Olson's on Wisconsin Avenue. Above, up, it's not there anymore. Um, it's an Apple store now, I believe. Um, and S.J. Perlman entered me into the world and then, um, yeah. then I became quite... yeah fond of the history of the New Yorker and the, and, and the magazine and, and its cartoons. And there's like, you know, um, and there's one in my last book because of, what, because of what I said before about the idea that you can't do, you can't talk about anything without having a New Yorker cartoon in your life. Um, uh, I'm trying to, it's this one, I don't know, it's, um, What's the caption again? The caption is, um, so it's, it's uh, two spectators watching the, um, 
uh, watching gladiators fight with lions. Um, and it says, what if this isn't the best way to choose a nominee? <laughs> um, and it's Brendan, is it Lopper, Loper? Loper, yeah. Mm -hmm. Loper. Um, anyway, yeah. that's essentially what my entire book is about. I listened to your book. I loved it. Thank you. Oh, I, thank I you. Have a copy, but I listened to it. I listened to you read it. It was great. Oh, thank um, you. One of your one of your classmates offered that it was Bloom Country was what you Bloom Country. Title. Yes. Yes, yeah, so you can thank, thank Jennifer you. Sanders for that. Thank you, can Jennifer. I offer, <laughs> can I offer one last question for both of you? Mm -hmm. um, sure. This came through actually prior to the event, but um, the question was for both of you. Is there a past accomplishment for either of you? Um, of which you are really most proud of? And is there a dream project which you have not be yet been able to work on? Go ahead, John. Rashad, best <laughs> accomplishment I'm proudest of. I don't know, I don't know. The last foot I put in front of the other. Um, uh, um, I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not, it's not, I'm not good at that. Uh, the project is my next, the, the project I really want to complete is my next book. Um, What's so it's a, it's a, um, a book about these notebooks that I've carried around in my back pocket since oh. I was 18. Um, oh. and, uh, the collection of them over the last 32 years. Um, so that's, that's sounds great. Liza, what about uh, you? Oh, um, well, I'm proud of funny ladies. Um, and going forward, what, what was the question? What, what am I looking forward to? Is there a dream project that you'd love to do that you haven't yet had a chance to? I don't. No, I mean, I want to continue live drawing. Uh, well, that, but also the one dream project was to do a, a history of women cartoonists globally, but I think that's probably um, too big. <laughs> but that would be really fun to do, exciting to do, because there are, I, I've gotten to meet many women cartoonists in different parts of the world, uh, and they have, they have it much worse than we do. I mean, we don't have it bad at all, but they, that's one thing I want to add, guys. There's a lot more women cartoonists at the New Yorker now. It's 50-50, it's so it's wonderful. Oh, that's great. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll we'll go ahead and put you down for the next two Conversation with Friends events to talk about John's new book. And then when you <laughs> go ahead and categorize all the women cartoonists of the world, we'll get you back <laughs> to talk about it. Um, I think on that note, thank you both so very much for being here. We are so grateful for being able to have this conversation. Um, thank, uh, thank you, Liza, for sharing so much about your insight, your process, your wit, and your wisdom. Um, John, thank you for leading us through this excellent and eye-opening conversation. Thanks to all of you for being here. Um, these events are really about the Sidwell Friends community, so we truly appreciate you spending some time uh, and being in community here with us. Um, on that note, we have two more Conversation with Friends events scheduled for April, so be sure to head to sidwell.edu slash CWF to see those dates and get more information. Um, and like I said, this series really is about our community, so if you have an idea, if you can think of a fellow alum or community member that you'd love to see featured in Conversation with Friends, let us know. Send an email to alumni at sidwell.edu and share your ideas with us. Um, thank you again, John and Liza, so much for your time tonight, and we'll see you all very soon. Thank you, Anna, and thank you, John, so Thanks, much. Thanks, Anna. Sure. Bye. Thanks, Liza. T take care, everybody. Guys. Nice.